Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Richard Sachs, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of Rio Grande and Rio Grande Community College, uh, located in Rio Grande and three other locations in beautiful southeastern Ohio. This afternoon, I am delighted that I have a faculty member and three students from Swansea College of Art, uh, part of the University of Wales, Trinity St. David's. And first of all, here on stage with me, I've got Gwen Benyon. She's a printmaker. Um, her work is based in language and culture and the locality of that part of Wales. She's a community creative facilitator, and she's the faculty lead um, for these um, Welsh students who are coming here. Gwen, welcome Hi, to Rio nice. Grande. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've always enjoyed mm -hmm. as a dean or as a provost, uh, both here and elsewhere, is overseeing art faculty, and I really don't oversee them very much. I just make certain they don't break any federal or state rules, and I let them use their creativity. Tell us a little bit about what it is you do. How much is teaching? How much is lecture teaching? How much is studio just facilitating the artwork? Well, my, my role in the faculty is to lead in the Welsh Medium provision and to provide the opportunity for any student to do any of their programs through the medium of Welsh. Um, I was laughing when you were saying about not breaking rules. That's always the case with fine art, really, is that you know, the, you know the, there are no boundaries in a way, isn't it, to what people look at and study. So I can work with anybody in the Faculty of Art and Design, and that could be a media student, an automotive design student, anybody. Um, but my role is really to allow that student to do a part of their degree through the medium of Welsh. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Now, again, I apologize for my accent or lack of an accent, um, but one thing I've learned in the three and a half years I've been here is how strong a steadfit is. Yeah. And I know that you you do a lot of work with um, school age uh, children in, in Wales about that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the steadfit in Wales is um, works on lots of levels. It works nationally uh, and locally. Um, and school level, so you know it, it works on, on lots and lots of different ways, and it happens all the time. Um, so I'm involved quite strongly with the national estate, both for the adults and for the children. I normally do art workshops in those situations. I can also prepare kids in schools with their art projects, really, for the Eisteddfod as well. Um, one of our students you'll be talking to later, Thomas, uh, you can talk to him about the Eisteddfod as well because he's had a lot of engagement with the Eisteddfod and be, been very, very successful in winning awards in the Eisteddfod. And so that within my role, role in the faculty is really important. Um, I also then am I'm, I'm on the committee for our local Eisteddfod, which is a big Eisteddfod. It celebrated 50 years last year. Um, it's a big local Eisteddfod. We've got a, a big... Um, a uh, facility that will seat, seat about 3,000 people to come and see it, so it's a big um, local thing. And then also then at school level, I don't get involved really with the ones at school level, but they tend to happen round about St. David's Day, and it's something that a lot of the children then sing and dance and recite and, you know, lots and lots of different things. Um, yeah. So on screen now, you see me here working with schools, with a school on a, on a community project. Um, we were looking at um, local stories. I'm really, really interested in local stories. Uh, and this is a story about the elephant in Trigaron. Um, and that's quite an interesting story from um, 1848. An elephant came to Trigaron and died. Um, and so we mapped, um, we looked at geography and we looked at the map being of the end of this an animal's life, really. It's buried in Trigaron, apparently. Nobody's ever found its remains. Um, so I really like to work with, with children um, and adults of, of, of all age groups, really, um, on creativity. Okay. Now, um, one of the enjoyable things um, I have about interacting with our people from Wales is you guys have the best out of office email I've ever seen. <laughs> and when I first saw yours the other day, um, it was about six in the morning. I won't describe how I was dressed. I was in my apartment and I was drinking coffee and opening up emails. And I focused and I took my glasses <laughs> off and I thought, I need some more coffee. And then I realized the first four lines were in Welsh. Um, that's a fascinating issue for me because yeah. as an English PhD, and, and here it is. And so again, if, <laughs> you know, I saw from and subject and I figured the rest should be in English. And I really had problems. And then I, again, I thought, is this what a mini stroke is like when you're trying to read something and you can't actually it? But again, um, I was okay. It yeah. was just, it was in Welsh. And I'm fascinated with that because a lot of my postdoctoral work has been in American Indian studies. Oh, right. And a problem in the Western United States is the elderly people know the original 
language, mm -hmm. but all American Indian languages are oral languages. So even though the Cherokee have created a syllabary, for most people it's oral. And I remember when an elder died at Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico, Leslie Silco said it was like a library burned mm -hmm. because that person and their language and their ideas and narratives are all gone. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, um, quickly, because we want to bring these students up, what is the future of Welsh? I mean, I would love to see it if people would continue to speak it, but um, is there a BBC channel for Welsh, or is everything in English? And if all your programming is in English, what are the chances of the next generation learning well, Welsh? We, all children in schools, um, have to uh, study through the medium of Welsh until um, they leave school at 16. Really? So that's really okay. important that that happens. Um, uh, the Welsh government want a million Welsh speakers by 2020, uh, 2050, sorry. Um, so that's a challenge. Uh, and for this everybody. is a country of how many million? Oh, yes, now you're asking me something. Oh, sorry, I okay, okay, I, 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 I so can perhaps check one that. of the others would know better, yeah, but yeah, yeah um, so, you I, know, I think there's the only six or seven million yeah, in Wales, yeah, though, so yeah, that's a yeah. significant percentage. It's a significant percentage, percentage have, yeah. Uh, that's very exciting um, yeah, to think so about. So, within my role in the faculty, you know, that's really important to me. Um, we're lucky in a way, the, the Welsh tradition was an oral tradition a long, long time back, um, but now it is an actual written tradition, so everything gets written down and, and gets, and then you know, so it, then yeah. therefore it can be studied and developed. Yeah. It's a problem in art because we don't have many books on, on, on international art written in Welsh, so that's a little bit of an issue, but um, yeah, so it's, okay. uh, yeah. That, that's great. That's fascinating. And we'll talk more about that at some point, but it'll have to be off screen. I think we're going to take a brief break right now so that you guys have this message from Volvo Cars of North America. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, again, for our show today, we have, uh, we already spoke with uh, Gwen B Benyon, the professor from Swansea College of Art at, at University of Wales, Trinity St. David's. And I have three students here, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, Gwarad first. Um, my name's Gwarad. I'm a graphic design student, uh, currently going into my third and final year of study. Hello, my name is Thomas. I'm uh, an art student, fine art student at Swansea College of Arts, going into my third year. Hello, I'm Caitlin. Um, I've recently graduated from fine art at Swansea College of Art. Okay, great. And thank you so much for coming. All three of these young uh, art students or recent art grads uh, are in a short term exchange here at University of Rio Grande. We're delighted to have them here. Um, let's just start with Gwarad. Now, you have an interest in music. Uh, what, what, um, uh, what do you play? Um, I'm a drummer. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm currently in a band based in Swansea. Okay. Um, and uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen The Commitments, the movie about the Irish uh, soul band, but I've got to ask, who are your influences? 
Um, it's really a ra range, generally. We try not to focus on any one thing. Sort of okay. A broad base of rock music, I okay. think, is... Would it be what we call indie rock? Or, or not exactly? Yeah, yeah okay. I suppose a sort of indie rock, pop okay. rock, maybe. Okay, and your graphic design work, I saw we have some posters and things like that. I think Mike Thompson is going to try to get some of them up. Um, I know in terms of when I've had to plan posters for you know, campus movies and things like that, it's fascinating to think about how you, where you're placing things and the font you mm -hmm. want to use and things like that. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about your poetics of printmaking? Well, the basis behind this was to, well, firstly, Swansea Music Scene previously has been quite successful. It's been very busy. There's been a lot of local bands, a number of venues recently quite a few of them are shut down. There's less people trying to get into music, so this was an event sort of designed towards rekindling um, Swansea's interest, love of music. So um, I've sort of gone for a, a slightly older style, um, sort of a, to create a sort of nostalgic effect, I suppose, because um, of what the music scene used to be there. Um, nice block, plain letters, nice and clear. Um, and nicely divided up so you can see which. Right. Now, I've seen various versions of this, and sometimes it says September 9th, sometimes it says Medi, M E D I. Is that a Welsh name? That's for Welsh for September, yeah. For the, September, with okay. The goal of it being a sort of bilingual event to not only promote music, but Welsh music as well. That's great. And Mike briefly showed uh, some printmaking you had. That was, the problem was a postman who's also a snake charmer. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it was a bit of a humorous brief, I suppose. We had to, we were tasked with designing a corporate identity for both the postman and the snake charmer. Um, we had to come up with a name um, and then go from there, really. So you can see the logo there, it's sort of like a snake, but also and, a letter. Yeah, and it's wonderful, and the curve there and everything, it, it looks great. It reminds me a little bit, there's a federal... Um, federal uh, office in Washington that's known as the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. I have no <laughs> idea. When, when I, ATF they call it, alcohol. Let's put alcohol, tobacco, and firearms in the same room and see what might happen. I mean, does that seem like a bad idea or what? And that's exactly what I thought of when I saw Snake Charmer and Postman. I thought, it's so idiosyncratic. And, and as Gwen said earlier, that's art, right? Mm -hmm. We break outside the envelope. We start trying to do different things. Yeah. So, so that's fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Tomas, tell us a little bit about the portraiture you do and also the medium that you use. Um, it seems like almost, um, it, it seems like sketching, but it also seems like, like um, almost like it's a painting? What medium are you using and what kind of paper? Um, usually I work with oil paint and charcoal um, okay. and I like to work on a variety of surfaces such as um, paper, canvas, cardboard even um, and um, my interest in the human head um, has always um, has just developed over the years since studying art in school, really. But uh, mo uh, recently, more recently, uh, my interest has expanded to the human body. So I think that has come from looking at the works of the old masters, uh, such as Rembrandt, Velasquez, um, uh, Tintoretto, and so on. But uh, I also uh, really get inspired by looking at uh, contemporary artists such as Frank Auerbach, Francis Bacon, Giacometti. Um, so, but I've been trying to challenge myself by trying to really work into the material and trying to find uh, a form in the chaos or the mess. Um, so deliberately trying to overwork um, and hopefully have some sort of harmony to it all uh, in the end so um, it's been a um, it was a really uh, important year second year to really try and experiment so um, I've tried to do that so uh, these are the 
the results. Yeah, um, and again, you've got an amazing vision. Um, Jeannie, are they going to Short North Art District in Columbus? Okay, because, and, and Larchmere, the Larchmere Boulevard Art Galleries by Shaker Square in Cleveland, Cleveland Institute of Arts, there's just so many things you guys should see, both the great old art museums we have in Ohio, but also some of the art district where a lot of what I w was taught is avant-garde art, you know, beyond the great masters is, is really shown. And believe it or not, there's some really vibrant districts. What we found in the United States is it used to be places like Boston and New York City and San Francisco, Seattle, well those are four of the most expensive cities in the country. Mm -hmm. What we've seen in places like Cleveland and Columbus and, and Detroit is abandoned factory buildings now becoming arts places because they're cheap in Cleveland and they're not cheap in LA anymore. So suddenly we're seeing what we call a Rust Belt arts renaissance with younger people because unless you're a famous artist, you can't afford a loft in LA, but you can have a loft in Cleveland and Columbus and that's really re-energizing. So I, I'm getting chills now seeing some of that work. The kind of work that we just saw from Tomas is the kind of work you'll see in some of those galleries and that's wonderful. Um, Let's move on to Caitlin. Caitlin Littlejohns is a fine arts student, and I'll let her talk about it more in a minute, but um, from sending the slides to me, I could see that she does pen and ink work, and I was amazed last week when I opened them up. I almost choked. I think I was eating, and it was so beautiful. I would kind of went <gasps> like that, and I think I aspirated like my, like you know half of my sandwich or something. So so your artwork is so oh, wonderful. You. you almost killed me with it <laughs> um, because. Uh, but at any rate, so let's look at this. Tell us about what you're doing, and okay. I, I'm just amazed. I just find it incredibly incredibly moving. So all of my work is landscape based. I love going out and walking and taking the sketchbook out with me and working outdoors. Um, it's all done in Indian ink on watercolour paper. Um, whilst painting, I like to use sort of unconventional tools to paint with. Um, I use various sticks and objects that I find whilst walking out in the landscape. Um, the sizes of the paintings I do vary greatly. Some are very, very small scale, so p almost postcard size. And then, as shown you, and then some are quite, quite large scale, so almost five by four foot. So it's, it's a really interesting mix of different movements with the brush and, yeah, sort of. A lot of it, as you can see here, is um, my interest was based around forest fires. We had a lot of forest fires going on in Wales back yeah. home. Okay. And although devastating, there, there is sort of a beautiful aesthetic or quality to that fire as harmful as it is to our environment. Yeah, I was really, really interested in focusing on that back home. I had no idea about the um, fires, mm. but um, a, a continuing motif seems to be bare trees. Yeah. And I don't know, uh, maybe some of the people in the audience are old enough to remember the early Fleetwood Mac album called Bear Trees. This is before they got popular, before Stevie Nicks joined the group. And there's a beautiful scene that is is very reminiscent of your work, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. It's called Bear Trees. It's Trees in Winter, and that's the name of the album. Ah. And that was one of the names of the song Bear Trees by Fleetwood Mac. It, it was in high school for me, so 71 or 72. This is well before uh, Buckingham and Nicks joining the group. Um, one thing I'm hearing, and I heard it from Tomas as well, Tomas talked about using charcoal, and now Caitlin has just talked about using twigs and things like that and using those pigments or dyes or whatever. When I was in graduate school in Ann Arbor three decades ago, I had a friend who was an MFA student, and when she ran out of charcoal, she used cigarette ash, which stunk horribly, but she was still able to get some of the things. So, um, Caitlin or Tomas or others, talk more about using actual things from the landscape, like, like the picked up twigs and things yeah. like that, and why that's important For me, to you. personally, I just, I just love the different marks that you get from using uh, materials, not just a brush, you know. You can have sort of scratchy marks, or really random sometimes, but it also can work in your favor some, you know, sure. sometimes. Sure. I don't know about you. Uh, I like to uh, use found materials. Yeah. Um, so with me, it's more looking in the skip rather than the landscape. Okay. Um, but as Caitlin said, because um, sometimes using a, a brush, it can um, cause habits almost yeah. that you get used to certain marks and you know what 
it's going to turn yeah. out, but if you um, use different materials to usual, it can bring new and exciting marks out mm. yeah. um, and fresher marks. New then. ideas develop yes. and things then. Right. And the issue of making it local, I, as both of you were talking, I thought about something I read years ago about Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect, that whenever he built a house or something, he wanted to mix the bricks on site and he would scrape some of the dirt from the area so that the color of the dirt would dirt. be repeated in the bricks for the house that he was going to build. Even though he had very iconoclastic styles, he wanted it to be local. Um, we've got only five or six minutes left, but I'd like any of the three of you to wax eloquent on um, what does it mean to be a Welsh artist? How important is that? Or some, I've always argued that we're all partial positions, you know, male and female, yeah. you know, different color hair, different color eyes, different color, different religious background or cultural background. So um, any and all of the three of you, and I'd like you all to talk on this briefly, how important is being Welsh? Is that a determining factor? Or are there other real strong factors like that mm -hmm. you might be a female artist or you might be a redheaded artist or, <laughs> or a green-eyed artist or, or anything else? For me, I'm really proud to be Welsh. I'm proud of my heritage and where I come from. And the, the Welsh landscape is beautiful. We almost take it for granted, you know. So yeah, being a female Welsh artist and working landscape based and really appreciating my, appreciating my landscape and my surroundings and bringing that to light is what's really important to me. So yeah, I guess right. you could say being Welsh is really, really a big part of my work, really. Great. I find it so important, um, like Hayden said, being proud to be a Welsh artist. If you look at Welsh art history, there's so many great Welsh artists. You're thinking of Gwen John, Catherine Williams, and Shani Rhys James, who works now. It's so important to um, to keep you know believing in that, and um, to well, especially um, Welsh-speaking artists. That's another thing. It opens doors um, and um, I yeah I'm very proud. <laughs> I think my perspective is slightly different as a design student but I'm definitely certainly no less proud of being Welsh. It, designing in Welsh in the Welsh language especially poses numerous new challenges. You've got word forms that are completely different so you make a design that works brilliantly in English and then kind of readjust it to work it in Welsh and it, it, it definitely is something to be proud of I feel. Right, great. Um, so let's talk about the future a little bit. Do you folks see yourselves teaching? Because that's what a lot of artists do in the United States. You know, they have a, a teaching gig so that they can do art on the side. Or um, in certain parts of the country, people go off and get degrees in, in curating art so that you can work in a museum and then sometimes still do your art on the side. Um, what, what is the future for you three? remarkable young fun artists. <laughs> Optimistically, hopefully just being able to focus on producing work and in a living that way. Um, potentially teaching maybe, but I think I'd like to try and put that off as long as the future <laughs> is possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm really inspired by my art lectures in Swan at Swansea okay. College of Art. I feel I need to be fed by their knowledge yeah. and art history. And that's something that really appeals to me, um, talking about art to younger people and keeping the art history alive. So um, that's something that really appeals to me and it's so inspiring hearing that how they, uh, the lecturers spend their time between making art and teaching, and that's something that really and, inspires me. Yeah. And I was going to say, a, a history of art lecture as an English professor mm. is one of the best things I can possibly hear. In New Mexico, I had a ceramicist who did a three-hour history of art course once a week on Friday mornings, and when I could, I would sneak in the back. And, you know, he was using, you know, multiple screens and talking, mm. And the whole thing, I mean, the three hours went like nothing. It yeah. was just wonderful. But yeah. um, I'm hoping to do a master's next, but I also would like to go into teaching, I think. Perhaps not just yet, but I am looking at going into teaching as the next step, but yeah. sort of foundation level, so university. 
Not now, that. in American universities, your MFA would either be a, a studio MA or it would be an art history MA. Right, okay. So, so, so do you want to make art as part of your master's or Yeah, or I study still art? like to keep painting. And okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I don't want to let that go now. Okay, good, <laughs> good. Well, I'm sorry to say we're in our last couple seconds of the broadcast. This has been wonderful. Gwen, thank you for bringing these extraordinary students to us. And again, Guared, Tomas, and Caitlin, good luck to all of you. Thank we you. Have, thank you, um, you. You have brilliant futures ahead of you, and we thank you thank for you. sharing some time with us oh, here today. Thank you, thank thank you very you. much. Okay. Good night. You guys behave. <laughs>